New York City sits at 40 degrees latitude. In August, the water at nearby Long Beach can be as warm as 75 degrees Fahrenheit, enticing hundreds of people to wade into the waters and swim. Shelter Cove, California is also at 40 degrees latitude, but in the warmest part of the year, the temperatures of the water never get much above 55 degrees Fahrenheit, a full 20 degrees cooler than the ocean on the East Coast. You likely know that ocean water near the equator is warm, while ocean water near the poles is cold. So why would ocean water that is at the same latitude have such different temperatures? The answer is ocean currents. The main current on the east coast is the Gulf Stream, which is bringing warm water from the tropics north. The main current on the west coast is the California Current, which is bringing cold water down. But where did these currents come from in the first place, and what keeps them going? I'm Science Mom. I'm Math Dad. And today we're going to learn all about thermohaline circulation. <laughs> Hello and welcome. We are going to be talking all about ocean currents today. Quick welcome to Olivia in Minnesota, to Jill Snelson and Isaac. Ember and Logan from California. Nora from Wisconsin. Mia and Cohen from California. Special welcome to you if you're watching the replay as well. So first, before we talk about the thermohaline circulation and ocean currents, we want to talk a little bit about tides because our ocean is very dynamic. Things are changing all the time. And to understand tides, it helps to understand a little bit about forces and how water moves. So I have a small amount of water in this cup here, and you can see that I'm pouring it back and forth between these cups, and there are no tricks. No, no messes, right, Science Mom? Well, if I do this right, there won't be any messes. So oh. there's water in this cup, and if I spin the cup around, the water stays in the cup. What? <laughs> And How did that happen? Almost all of it stayed in the cup. I did spill just a tiny bit at the end. It's a little tricky to get it to stop. It happened because there was a second force besides gravity. And that force was centrifugal force. When I was spinning it around, the momentum of that spinning was pushing the water into the bottom of the cup, even when it was upside down. Now, there is another force that is acting on the Earth's oceans besides just the gravity of Earth and that is the moon's gravity. Ooh. So let's pull up an image so that we can explain this because this is pretty amazing. So you know that gravity pulls water and everything else on earth down. Well, the moon is about one one hundredth the size of earth. It's quite a bit smaller, but it exerts a force of gravity as well. And the water on the oceans that is closest to the moon here it bulges outward towards the moon. And did you know, Math Dad, that the Earth actually bulges as well? Because the, the moon has that much gravity. It does, it has enough gravity, it actually causes the entire Earth to bulge and move just a little bit, but it's so small, you can't detect it except with really specific instruments. But the tides, that we definitely notice because twice a day, there is a high tide and a low tide in most places. Okay, and this is obviously not to scale because that's a really high tide. Yes, this is not to scale. And a the thousand moon, kilometers. And tall. the moon is not quite that close to Earth either. It yeah. is actually quite a bit further away. Now, why does the moon affect the oceans if it's so far away? It's because gravity can is a pretty noticeable force. It's a force that we really notice. You know, if you jump, you're not going to jump and go all the way into space. You're going to come right back down because of gravity. Everything that has size or mass has gravity. The moon has gravity too. And in some sense, it's not such a big influence because a tide is typically going to be, I don't know how much it goes up, eight feet or something. It all depends on uh, where you are. In fact, some areas in the world don't even really have noticeable tides because of the way that the currents and the land masses work. Huh? If Earth was just an ocean planet, the tides would be very regular and uniform. But Earth is a planet with a big, a lot of land in it, and that land interrupts the tides. Wait, wait, so there's a tide on the far side of the Earth from the moon? There is, so this one makes sense. The, the water is being pulled towards the moon, 
But because of the way that gravity works and that the pole is stronger at the equator, you actually get a little bit of a bulge here on the opposite side as well. So if this is you living, let's say, over here on this landmass, in one day, you're going to experience one high tide, a low tide, a high tide, and then another low tide. That will be one full rotation. So right. in most most places, there will be two tides in a day. All right. So so we're, this is the North Pole down look? This is look? looking at the North Pole. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I was a little confused there, but you're, you're saying, okay, so... So, yeah, so somebody like, like living on the equator, for example, would experience two different high tides in one day. In one day, most places. But like I said, tides are complicated. Some places experience just one a day, some two, most two a day, and some don't really have much difference at all. So it does because, depend. <laughs> because of the land, the way that the land masses go through the oceans, it sort of messes up the tides just a little bit. But the biggest and best tides you will get, both high and low, happen around the full moon and the new moon. When it's a full moon or a new moon, then the sun and the moon are lined up together and ah. you get an extra tug on the Earth's water. And that makes even higher and lower tides than normal. Double teaming. Any guesses where you'll have find the biggest tides in the world? I would think around the equator because that would have, or it, where um, this situation here where they're lined up perfectly, well, around the equator, you have a little bit of a bulge most of the time, but it's actually halfway in between the North Pole and the equator. That's where you have the biggest movement. Ah. And in the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia, not only are we nicely situated halfway between the equator and um, the North Pole, but we have this nice big inlet right here. And this is where we have the biggest tides in the world. How big? 50 feet or 15 meters. What? <laughs> so you see these people walking down here. They're very, very small and low tide. This all becomes mud flats. And then high tide, it's up here where you see that, that mark on the rocks. Whoa. The tides here are the biggest in the world. It's really incredible. And it's so big, in fact, <laughs> that <laughs> this pier that they wrote, and these are full-size shipping containers. These are These are pretty big that you see the boat sinks all the way down and is just on the rocks at low tide. And then at high tide, it's floating. <laughs> and there are rivers that go into the Bay of Fundy. When the tide comes in, you actually have a tidal bore where the direction of the river changes. Now all the water is running upstream because the tide's coming in. Oh, wow. Oh, that's pretty cool. Now, sometimes when people talk about the Bay of Fundy and they hear that there's a 15 meter difference in the height of high tide and low tide, they think that there's like a big tsunami that comes into the bay twice a day and just wipes everything out, like a wall of water 50 feet high. That's not how it works. The change in tide is gradual. So you have a wave that comes in a little farther, and then the next time the wave goes out and comes in, it's not going out quite as far, and it's coming in farther. So it takes takes about six hours for the tide to change. Okay, that, that is pretty gradual. But, but wow, what a big difference. It is. The tidal bore, though, when you have the direction of the river change, that is pretty impressive. And that can be a wave up to about two or three feet high that just is coming up. So you could actually surf on that wave. Yeah. But look, just to get a sense of how big of a tide change this is, like that would bury Florida if they had that much of a, a tide change. Like, wow. Yeah, pretty <laughs> incredible. So we talked just a little bit about tides. Now let's talk about ocean currents. Tides do influence our ocean currents just a little bit, but there's actually a bigger driving force that influences our ocean currents. And without a bit of an accidental experiment, we might not have discovered it. Mm. In the 1940s to 1950s-ish, there were a lot of nuclear explosions happening as people tested nuclear weapons. And that put radioactive trace elements all over the entire world. And because the surface layers of the ocean had these small amounts of radioactive material, but the deeper layers didn't, that allowed scientists to measure exactly how fast these huge currents were moving. And when we talk about the thermohaline circulation, we're talking about an ocean current that goes over the whole entire world. Oh, wow. 
It really does flow all over. It does. It connects all of the world's oceans. And this is such a cool thing. And there's a video from NASA we're going to play real quick, just so you can sort of see this visualization and see how it happens. And it's mainly driven by freezing ice at the North Pole. That's one of the main drivers of this ocean current. So here we are looking at the Gulf of Alaska, or Gulf of Alaska, oh my goodness, the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream <laughs> has it curves up towards Iceland and Europe. And as it curves up, the water cools and it freezes. And when water freezes, the ice is left out because water just wants to form a crystal with other water molecules. And so the water that's around that ice gets saltier and heavier and it sinks. And this sinking right here is one of the big things that is driving this current off the coast of Greenland. And then that cold, dense water flows back. It's like it's being pushed from on top by more cold water coming. It flows deep, 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 all the way down and around the bend of South America. <laughs> and then it keeps going. And this current wraps around the entire world. And they, they can even cross. The warmer wa water is higher, so it will cross. Yes. Oh, that's cool. It's like a huge conveyor belt, a very slow moving conveyor belt. On the whole, it's going to take a little over a thousand years for water to circulate completely. And we're talking about moving <laughs> at, a, at a rate of about a centimeter per um, per minute or so. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's creeping along. Isn't that a neat thing to see? Th that That is pr it's pretty cool. Uh, uh, centimeter per second. Yes, I think, I think centimeter per second. That. That's what I meant. Yeah. Centimeter per second. So that is the thermohaline circulation. And what it does for our planet is so important. And you might think, well, it's just moving heat around. And moving heat around is nice. It's taking warm water from the tropics, moving it up, and then cold waters are being moved back down. But what it's doing that's most important, really, is bringing nutrient-rich waters from below up. Uh -huh. Because the ocean, remember how yesterday, on Monday we talked about how the ocean is kind of like a big dark fridge? Yeah. where most of it is empty, cold, and dark. Well, the thing that you need at the surface most of all to grow is iron. Iron is one of the elements that is really limited in the ocean. And if there's like a volcanic eruption and more ash goes into the ocean somewhere, sometimes you'll see huge algae blooms because all of a sudden they have the iron they need and they're ready to grow. Mm. So if you have cold, deep waters from down below coming up, they carry nutrients up and kind of fertilize the ocean and help it to be healthy. I hadn't thought of volcanoes as being so life producing, but apparently, especially in the ocean, they can be. Yeah. So let's explore the two parts of this thermal haline current, thermal and haline. Haline means salt. And so I have two containers here. One of them is salt water and one of them is fresh water. And Math Dad, I'm gonna challenge you without tasting them or anything else, to see if you can tell me which is which. And the only tool you have is an egg. You can tell me to do something with the egg and see if you can guess wait, wait. which is salt water, which is fresh water. Okay, so one, one, of, one of them is salt water, one of them is fresh water, and we have to tell which one's which. Uh, okay, put the egg in that one right there, yeah. All Let's right, see what put the egg in, and it sinks all the way to the bottom. Okay. You wanna try the other one now? Let, let's try the other one. Um, we'll put the egg in this one, and it and it floats. floats. Okay. So it's clearly a magical egg. It is yeah. not a magical no, egg. It is a, a regular egg. All right, I, know, I know what's going on here. One one of the liquids is more dense than the other. So if, if the liquid is more dense than the egg, the egg will float. And if the egg is more dense than the liquid, the egg would sink. That's right. So what that tells me is that this tall one is more dense. So it has to be the one that's salty. That's right. And Remington Wolf has got it in the chat. It floats in the salt water. It does. So in the salt water, the egg will float. And in the cold water, the egg sinks. <laughs> and this means if we have salt water and then we put cold, fresh water on top of it, we will get a layer. Ah, uh, yes. And Math Dad made one of these layers yesterday. I'm going to grab it real quick and put it right here on the table. And we're going to see where our egg sits in this layer. So this one, it's a little hard to see because we maybe accidentally used a little too much food coloring. What? <laughs> it was flawless. Just a, put something white behind it. There we go. Now yeah. you can see it better. So you can see these layers are moving just from the motion of me picking it up and carrying it to the table, but they're staying separated. 
because the bottom is the saltiest. And then each layer has a little bit less salt until we get up to the top. This red layer has no salt at all. I actually cheated and used some sugar too. Oh, and there's some sugar in there too. Full disclosure, because it's easier to get sugar to dissolve in water than salt. Right. Now we're going to drop our egg and I want to see some guesses in the chat. What layer do you think it will stop at? Because Ooh. the bottom is really sugary salty, so it shouldn't sink all the way to the bottom. Somewhere in between. I wonder ready if it to will, find out. We'll mix all the colors and we won't be able to tell. I hope it doesn't mix the colors. I'm going to drop it nice and slowly. So I'm putting it into this red layer and then I'm going to let go. It is doing a little bit of mixing, but it looks like the yellow is the home for the uh -huh. egg. Yeah. Morgan and Eleanor and Mimi, Grace and Ember and Logan were all correct in their guess that yellow was going to be where our egg landed. And that's because the density of this yellow, salty, sugary solution matches the density of what's in the egg. Yeah. Pretty cool, right? Yep. So we should probably explain a little bit more about how did we actually get the water like this? We had to be very careful to layer it slowly. So we actually put little pieces of bubble wrap that we had cut out from a package that we got. We cut out a little bit of bubble wrap, put it on top of this blue salty water. And then when we added the next layer, it didn't pour down and mix in with the blue. So we poured really slowly really down slowly. Like a funnel that with a straw attached and then and it then, was hitting the bubble wrap mm -hmm. and th that, that way there wasn't a lot of velocity of that water hitting the layer below it. That's right. And so we just had to trickle it and be very patient. And yeah, that, that ended up being beautiful. Now the water here, we have layers, but they're not caused by temperature. The, the temperature here is the same as the temperature here. They're caused by a difference in sugar concentration, sugar and salt. There's more salt and sugar down here. There's less up here. And I'm seeing several requests for us to spin or shake the container. We will do that at the end. But first, we're going to do <laughs> one more experiment. So I'm going to carefully set this one down on the side here. All right. Can we make a gradient just using heat? And the answer is yes. So we are going to set up a quick little experiment. And if you've seen Science Mom's Guide to Water videos, this one is familiar with. This one you'll be familiar with, but it's worth repeating. And oh. that, did are you, you going to make a nervous? mess? Yes. Yes. Are we making? So notice how I am prepared with towels. I have our computer and laptop up on blocks. And I have <laughs> towels right here. I am being very responsible, Math Dad. No worries. All right. Ooh. So we have yellow food coloring here. And this is going to be for our warm water. This is like bathtub temperature water. It's nice and warm. And in the ocean, you end up with layers, sometimes layers of water because of temperature, because cold water is more dense than warm water. And warm water will actually layer right on top of cold. That's what we're gonna see right now today. All right, so you gotta use yellow for warm and blue for cold, yep. the classic colors here, it makes sense. All right. And this water here had a bunch of ice cubes in it that just melted, so it is quite cold. Now the tricky part is to get these one on top of the other. And this is the part where there is a little bit of a mess warning. Messes can happen. But I will do my very best, Math Dad, to be oh, no. very careful and not do a mess. Oh no. Don't worry, I have towels. <laughs> you wanna do it over, <laughs> math, over this? Math Dad Tub? doubts my towels. Nope, we're gonna do it over right over oh, here. Oh gosh. Keep your fingers crossed, guys. Oh, I can't watch. I can't watch. And normally I have um, plastic, flat piece of plastic I use, but since we are moving and my plastic is missing, I'm using cardstock and it's not working quite as well. So we're gonna go ahead and take this layer out right now. Go ahead and just pull, pull it straight out, Math Dad. All right, I'm gonna pull it out. <gasps> and we see mixing because the Blue was cold and dense, it went straight down. The yellow was warm and less dense, it went straight up. They mixed together and they made green. Now on this other side, <laughs> we are gonna do the reverse. We're gonna put the yellow on top, the warm water on top, and we are gonna make a thermocline. We're going to make it so that it's layered warm water on top of cold water. Okay, okay, be careful, careful. Oh, messes. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, ready? ready? Yep, I'm ready. All right, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. 
and it's staying. Do you guys see this? We have yellow water on top of blue water. There's nothing. Oh, did you just knock over the container? Yeah. Let it let it be known. Math Dad made the mess. Science <laughs> Mom did not make the mess. <laughs> So this happens in real life all the time. And if you have a swimming pool or if you've ever been to a lake in the summertime, I bet you've experienced this right here. If you start to get into the water and it feels nice and warm and then you go deeper and all of a sudden the water's really cold, that is exactly what is happening. You are having a thermocline in the lake or in the swimming pool because the warm water has been warmed by the sun. It's less dense. Here, do you want this towel? Yep. And the cold water is not receiving that much heat from the sun. And so it's staying cold. And once you get a difference in density, these two layers don't want to mix and they will stay separate. All right, let's go back to our slides real fast here because we have a where in the world mystery for you guys. All right. So this national park has dramatic landscape of karst towers covered with trees and hundreds of dolmens. Oh, that's supposed to say, that's spelled wrong. Sorry, doe lines. Doe lines is what that's supposed to say. And caves surrounded by the River Lee. Where in the world is this? Boy. Do you have any idea, Math Dad? So you're pretending that I know what a karst tower is? A karst tower is made out it's... of limestone. Okay, so there's so... a little bit of a hint. All right, and when I hear the River Li, this sounds Chinese, maybe. So this is gonna be in China, I declare. And it actually is. Okay. So this is the River Li National Park in China. And those towers are have that shape because of all the rain and because this is entirely made, a landscape made out of limestone. So there are sinkholes and there are caves and there is this beautiful, dramatic, landscape where you have these super steep towers all over the place. Isn't that amazing? That, that's beautiful. It is a beautiful, beautiful setting. Yeah, okay, I, I really like that. All right, and now we have some birthdays. I want to wish a very happy birthday to Winston in Switzerland, who turned seven yesterday. Happy, hey, birthday. happy birthday, Winston. Happy birthday to Zachy in Canada, who turns eight years old tomorrow and a happy belated birthday to Addison. We hope you guys all have and had wonderful birthdays. And now it is time to see what you learned. Go to idempool.com slash science mom slash live and join us to test your knowledge. Prepare to be defeated. Yana says that the River Lee looks kind of like a forest from a fairy tale. And I, I say, I have to agree. It really does. It, yeah, it, it, it just doesn't look like that can't be naturally occurring. But it is all yeah. because of the limestone that is easily shaped by water. All right, our first question of the day, during which phase or phases of the moon does more tide activity occur? Mm. And so. just as a quick reminder, here we have our phases of the moon. So we have a full oh. moon, which- They can't see that. So... Oh yeah, they can, I did it on screen, screen yard. Oh, you cheated, okay. <laughs> she bypassed me. <laughs> that wasn't cheating, man. <laughs> Math Dad's used to pushing the buttons to change things, and so when I did it without him knowing, he was very surprised. <laughs> but I'll do it again. Ta-da! <laughs> so you have a full moon and a new moon, but in between, you either have the moon waxing, going towards full, or waning, going towards new. So they've got names for each of those. Yes, the waning gibbous, the wa waning crescent. So, so a crescent moon, I think, I think we're familiar with the crescent shape, the more pointy moon, but the gibbous moon is the one that's trying to be a full ball or somewhere between a half and a full. Yep. Okay. Right. So what phase does the moon have the highest tides? All Let's right. go ahead and finish and reveal. All right. They said full moon and new moon. That is absolutely correct. Nicely done. So I have to say, if you live near the ocean or are visiting the ocean and want to explore tide pools, if you're in an area that has good tide pools, going out at low tide can be so amazing. And if you can plan your trip so that you're with a new moon or a full moon, then your tides will be lower and you'll be able to find some really amazing animals in the tide pools. All right. Our next question. How many high tides are there per day? Mm. Three, two, one. Or it does depends. it depend? Mm. We'll find out. 
Ooh. Should we go grab Science Puppy real quick? Yeah. All right. I will go grab Science Puppy real fast. Excellent. And I will not walk in it, knock over any water while I go. Oh. Big water mess. Uh, I warned her. I told, said it would happen. All right. So the number of high tides per day. Looks like our answers are in. Finishing up. So the answer is it depends. That That's correct. Now, in some sense, the answer is two is that's accurate almost everywhere. Most places are going to experience two high tides per day, but there are some circumstances, maybe the geography of the, the it all, land, it where, all where it, can, it can be different. So I present you Science Puppy's favorite toy. Oh, and now he's not going to get a chew on it. All right. Question number three. There is an earth tide as well as an ocean tide. Ooh, is, is that, that true, true or, or false? false? So by earth time, we mean that twice a day, the earth bulges just like when the tides bulge. Mm. Is, that, mm. is that true or false? What do you think, Kaladin? What do you think? <laughs> he says, I think I'll drop my chew toy on your laptop because I think you have treats. <laughs> yeah, you can smell them. All right. And... The answer is true. Oh, it is true. It is true. I thought you I would have, stump them. You have to have very, um, whoops, you have to have very specific scientific instruments to be able to measure the earth tide, but there is an earth tide as well. Well, it kind of makes sense that the earth just wouldn't move as much. It's made of rock for the most part and it's a lot, lot denser than yeah. the, the ocean, but that's cool that it's measurable. We have a couple good questions about the egg that was floating. Does it work with a hard boiled egg as well? And yes, it will. And another question, how long will the egg float on salt water? Mm. And, in, and until it like decays and falls apart, it would float for a long time. Because that salt water is not gonna mix anytime soon well, or, it, or, or it depends. very slowly. Yeah, if the salt water makes it its way through the eggshell and mixes with the egg, then the egg would, would sink. But that would take a long time. Now I want to try it and have it be an experiment. Oh, no, we don't need an egg on our countertop for a six months, science mom. <laughs> All right, question four. What is the typical speed of the thermohaline circulation system? So one centimeter per hour, one centimeter per second, one kilometer per hour, one kilometer per second? Hmm. Kaladin just dropped his chew toy. Oh, is that what that was? Yep, that's what that was. That, that wasn't the sound of a big mess happening? Nope. All right. All right, what is the typical speed? Ooh, Millie Kay has a good question. How big is the biggest river? Next week, we have an entire lesson all on rivers. We'll be talking about that in a lot of detail. Yes, so we'll hold off for yep. now. But excellent question. And then Kaylee submitted a great joke. What did the happy ocean say? What did the happy ocean say? No idea. I'm currently happy. Oh, currently happy. <laughs> One centimeter per second is correct. Go unbeatable science kids. Oh. Very nicely done. And two more questions. What ocean current makes Ireland, Great Britain, Britain and the Scandinavian countries warmer than they would be otherwise? Is it the Gulf Stream, the Jet Stream, stream the North Pacific Current or the Equatorial Current? One Which of those one? four. This could be the one where I stump them, science mom. I don't know, math dad. I, I There's a tall bar out there, and tall bars are typically associated with math dad getting crushed. Uh, I'm okay, it's getting a little longer now. These kids are tough to stump. They they do a good job. Huh. Oh, Kaladin. Okay. Oh, yeah. Another mess, guys. Another mess. It's because Kaladin picked up the No, top she's end. trying to blame it on Kaladin, but we, <laughs> we, we know where the true blame lies. It's all right. I caught it mostly with my knee, so my knee's wet now, but the floor didn't get very wet. All right. And the answer is the Gulf Stream. So the graphic that you might have seen in the intro video, you were seeing the Gulf Stream. And it's not like it was a nice fluid. I mean, the currents are going all over the place. Well, the, especially at the surface of the ocean, the wind can cause all sorts of things to happen and the currents can change because of the wind, but that there's a main huge current that's driven by changes in the salt content and temperature and the thermohaline current, that's what causes the Gulf Stream. 
All right, then our final question, no hints, science mom. No hints. Fresh water is blank than salt water. Is it more dense than salt water or less dense? This could be the one. Um, this is definitely not the one. Look at that bar math, Dad. <laughs> That's all wrong answers. <laughs> Usually the big bar means they're getting it right, but this time that means they're getting it wrong. So I'm going to scoot over our two cups real fast because we're gonna bring that big one up and try giving it a stir. That's the last thing we'll do. Right. I think we can go ahead and finish and reveal. All right, and the answer is less, less dense. dense. That's right, it will float on salt water. That is correct. Nicely done, unbeatable science kids. <laughs> well, well played. I, I saw a couple questions asking if we had time to film more um, videos. We have not yet filmed more videos, but the, we- the, the dance videos? Yes, we can definitely share a a dance clip from earlier. Calden will do a dance for you. Oh, 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 staying alive, staying alive. Oh, 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 <laughs> staying yeah. alive. He was like, and that's enough. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, um, let's let's change the view to here real fast. I do want to show you what will happen if we disturb these layers. Can we get them to mix? And the answer is going to be yes. We can get them to mix if we do something to help the layers along. On their own, they're not going to mix. Math Dad did this yesterday, and it's still layered. And even us dropping an egg in didn't change that. It's still layered. So let me try putting this pen in. I won't get it all the way submerged. And just making a vortex. If I do this, can I get it to mix together? Oh, stop, stop, stop. Let's see what happens now. Will they separate again? And it, it's ah. so dark, it's kind of hard to see the egg, but the egg is right there. So these layers all mixed pretty well. And our blue, super sugary, salty layer at the bottom didn't mix quite as much. But you can see our egg is getting a little bit lower as that current continues to help it mix. But yes, it did go very dark because once you mix all the colors together, you get a pretty dark color. Yeah, uh, that, that was cool. That was fun. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed learning more about the thermohaline circulation and about tides and ocean currents. One thing that I do wanna mention that's super important to understand about the thermohaline circulation is that that conveyor belt of oceans, is of ocean water turning around, is super important for just maintaining the health of the oceans, especially because it brings up water from the deep that has more nutrients. And unfortunately, climate change is causing it to slow down. Ooh. And if it slows down completely, then that will cause even more climate change. So we keep our fingers crossed and do all you can to reduce carbon emissions. We do not want to have that current slow down. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, su super cool stuff. And it's, it's happening on a global scale. You can't believe that the oceans are moving that much on their own. It's pretty incredible. It really is. All right. Work hard. Grow smart, you guys. And... We will see you on Friday.